Hi, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Marisa Eisenberg, uh, Associate Professor of Epidemiology, Mathematics, and Complex Systems from uh, University of Michigan. Uh, she has a PhD and Master's in Science in Biomedical Engineering from uh, UCLA. And prior to coming to, to Michigan, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Mathematical Biosciences Institute at Ohio State University. Uh, fortunately, she saw the light and decided to leave Ohio State and come to Michigan since uh, 2012, where she has been ever since. Um, her work covers uh, the areas of mathematical epidemiology, mathematical biology, uh, inference assessment, uh, connecting <clears throat> models to data, and, and uh, really uh, bridging computing science, mathematics, uh, statistics, as well as, as solid epidemiology science, epidemiological science. Um, in terms of uh, and, and, uh, applications, uh, her work uh, has uh, uh, made important contributions in infectious diseases, particularly um, uh, cholera and other um, waterborne diseases, uh, as well as uh, human papilloma viruses and, and, and viruses that relate to cancer and, and, and helping us understand the, the dynamics of transmission promotion and then how that leads eventually to, to disease. Uh, in addition, she's, she's done a lot of work trying to understand how can we connect models and, uh, to data and understand really uh, uh, the nitty gritties of, of what can we learn and, and what are the limitations. And that's what she's going to be talking to us about. So I welcome Dr. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, identifiability and parameter estimation when working with mathematical models. Um, before I get going, I just want to say I was really excited that you did eBird stuff in your talk. I, I eBird, and anyway, I was very tickled by that. So that was all just a small thing. But anyway, um, so I usually start this, um, I often these audiences are kind of a blend between computation, stats, math, and like various applied areas. So how many people are familiar with identifiability as a thing? A couple, but mostly not. Okay, okay, I just, I like to get a sense of kind of how to pitch it. Uh, okay, so we're gonna talk about identifiability, and then we'll talk about two specific applications. One, uh, uh, on cholera vaccination in a refugee camp setting, and another on environmental surveillance for polio. All right, so what is identifiability? Um, identifiability addresses this question of, given a model and data, is it possible to recover, uniquely recover, your parameters from your model and data, right? And so this is a pretty fundamental question that we deal with all the time when we're doing inference or we're doing modeling or we're working with data. Um, and we can frame this question mathematically if we think about our model as a map from our, our parameters to our output or our data set that we want to know is that map injected, is it one to one? Because if it is, then given a set of data, we can pull back and figure out what our parameters were that generated it. And obviously that has important, oh, can you hear, oh, oh, thanks. I will probably still, it's just in my, like, instinct to gesture, so I'll probably, but yes, thank you, thank you. Um, but so, uh, so, so the, the, this question has important implications, right? Because oftentimes the parameters of our models have you know, meaning for the physical world, in my case, thinking about infectious disease transmission. So, um, so, so we want to kind of understand what the structure of our parameters uh, is and what can we recover from a given data set and a given model. Okay, so when I talk about identifiability, um, there are sort of two broad classes that overlap but are, are often considered. So practical identifiability um, versus structural identifiability. And so practical identifiability is sort of all the things that can go wrong for anyone who's ever worked with data, it can go horribly wrong in a bajillion different ways, right? So like, you know, I've had times where we're measuring a circadian phenomenon and they take the measurement once a day at the same time every day. Okay. 
the thing happens, it has a period of a day, so we're getting a constant, right? So, so you don't see any of the dynamics, right? So, so there are practical issues that can come up with how you measure your data that can really mess up what you can do with the data, right? And so, so that's practical identifiability. But there's another piece called structural identifiability, which gets at really the sort of fundamental structure of what it is you're measuring and what, what your model is structured like. So the really silly example that I use to explain this is suppose that, aha, perfect time for this. Okay, so suppose that you're given these red dots as your data, um, and the model you propose is y equals m1 plus m2 times x plus b, okay? <coughs> it doesn't actually matter how good your data is. It could be perfect and exactly on the line. There's no way for you to estimate m1 and m2 separately, right? Because all that you can see is the overall slope of this line. And so there's a bajillion, you know, there's an infinite number of ways for you to set m1 and m2 so that you get the exact same slope. Right? So that's like a very simple example, but it illustrates the idea of structural unidentifiability. It's just baked into the structure of our model that you can't estimate M1 and M2. Um, now, usually when I get to this point, someone is like, well, why are you trying to just combine them into a slope parameter called M and then estimate your model and move on with your day? And so that's the idea of identifiable combinations. So you can't estimate M1 and M2 separately, but you can estimate their sum, right? And so, um, it, it, the, that's perfectly a-okay unless M1 is like the life and death decision maker, you know, in which case you should measure something else, right, so that you can figure out what M1 is. So, um, so this is sort of the basic idea. Um, this is obviously a really trivial example, but in real world models, these issues come up all the time and they're not always obvious. The parameters are not always together. Things like non-dimensionalizing, if you do that in your sort of regular day to day, don't always get rid of these combinations, and so you have to sort of figure out what's going on. Okay, so um, what can you do when you have unidentifiability? So for one thing, the identifiable combinations often do have some sort of sensible meaning for a lot of the models that we work with. You can also often reparameterize or reduce the dimension of your model by squashing those together. So like when we combined M1 and M2, Right? We were reducing the dimension, the parameter dimension of our model to make a lower dimensional model that is identifiable. Right? So that's one thing you can do. You can also change what you can measure, and a lot of identifiability methods help you do that. So um, you could measure some other data set or measure some of the parameters explicitly. Um, and of course, if the unidentifiability doesn't actually affect your outcome of interest, then maybe you don't care and it's fine. You know, you just leave it there. That's okay too. So that's a thing. All right. Although it can make some of the, like, depending on what kind of algorithm you're using for your optimization or for your parameter estimation or whatever you have, it can make some of those things barf. So you do have to be a little bit careful. Okay. So there's a ton of different methods. We're going to talk about a couple of them today. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to give sort of one really simple example um, that was part of Yuan Cao's uh, PhD dissertation. And she was a MICDE fellow, so I thought I would just sort of highlight that. But anyway, um, she was looking at uh, dengue, so which is a mosquito-borne disease, um, and she was looking at it in Taiwan. And, and so we were using this model. So how many people are familiar with SIR-type models? Most people. Okay, but just in case. So this is one of the most commonly used mosquito-borne disease models out there. It's used for dengue, for Zika. It gets used by the CDC by WHO, by a lot of different folks to do forecasting or all kinds of different things. Um, and so what this model is set up to do, usually you might implement this either as ODEs or in a stochastic setting. Um, and basically you have humans who progress from susceptible, uh, they can then get bit by a mosquito, an infectious mosquito, and they, they go into this exposed or latent category E. This is again a time where I should use this. Um, and then they progress from there to being infectious and they can recover. Mosquitoes start off as aquatic, so they're immature. They grow up, they can be susceptible mosquitoes, and then they can also get infected. So simple model. You can write down, say, like a system of ODEs for this. Some of the parameters are known, so you don't have to estimate all of them. But I'm just going to sort of skip over that for the time being. Um, I just want to show this. So here are two different um, parameter sets with very different parameters that give you visually the exact same fit to a data set this is a, an epidemic of dengue in Taiwan. Um, and so you can see these two things look 
exactly the same. Um, and so if your goal was prediction, that might be fine. So like, you know, you could predict these points the same with either one of these things. But uh, in this case, we were thinking about interventions. And so we were thinking about what's called a larvicide intervention, which is where you put out sort of pesticides to kill off the mosquito larvae. It, um, you know, and, and so we simulated this larvicide intervention, and with these two different parameter sets, you get two wildly different predictions for what this intervention might do. So in one case, the intervention does almost nothing. The epidemic proceeds basically as it did before. And in the other one, the intervention works great. <laughs> And, you know, it squashes the number of cases by a ton, right? So this just illustrates that these problems can have impact and they can, they can mess you up if you're not paying attention to them. Okay, now that said, I, I kind of made this into a bigger deal than it is. When people use these models a lot, they use a lot of other data as well. They're not just looking at this. They have, you know, temperature data. They have other stuff. So, you know, there's, there's more to it. But just to sort of illustrate. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about a couple different approaches to identifiability. Um, and so the first one that you might sort of think about is, is thinking of sensitivity analysis. So probably everybody's familiar with sensitivity analysis as a thing? Yeah, ish, some nods. Okay, so, so the, the, the sort of obvious thing that one would think of is like, well, if your parameter is just insensitive, it's definitely unidentifiable, right? Because it doesn't do anything to your output, right? So, um, so that's certainly, certainly a thing. Um, but then you, you might also like sort of, it's not necessarily the case basically that if your parameter is sensitive, that it is therefore identifiable. Like your M1 and M2 were both perfectly sensitive, but they also could counterbalance one another and so they were not identifiable. So um, what you can do though, is you can look at your sensitivity matrix. Um, and so, which is like people, the just the Jacobian, some people call this the design matrix. Um, so in, if, if, you, if, you, if you have two parameters that can counterbalance one another, you would expect to see that as dependencies in the columns, right? So, um, so you can do this or the related matrix, the Fisher information matrix, um, People do this a lot, and you can use the rank of either of those matrices to look at how many identifiable parameters you have and how many I or identifiable combinations, right? Um, and so that's one method that we use all the time. Um, the only downside of that, of course, is that it's local. It's only a local uh, estimate. And it's hard sometimes if you have many different identifiable combinations that are sort of overlapping, it can be hard to disentangle exactly who's doing what and how things are connected up. So another method that's an analytical method that's gotten a lot of traction over the last se several years um, and that we work a lot on is this differential algebra approach. Um, and so I'm not going to dive into, although out of curiosity, how many people have taken ring theory or some sort of abstract algebra course? Okay, okay, so a few of you, but not everybody. So I'm not going to dive into the details of all this, but basically um, the idea um, for, with the differential algebra approach is that when you're working with um, a lot of the kinds of things that we, uh, of the kinds of models that we work on, ODE models, a lot of discrete models, things like this, can be framed in an algebraic setting. And then you can use tools from computational algebra to, so when we talked about the model as a map from your parameter space to your output space or your data space, that map is implicit, right? Because you have to simulate the model and then you see all the stuff that happens and you can see the output. But you can use computational algebra tools to get a sort of more explicit form of that map by eliminating out your unobserved variables. And so that's the idea behind the differential algebra approach. Uh, I'm gonna do like a teensy weensy example, teeny tiny, um, just to sort of illustrate with one that we can do by hand really easily. So, um, this is like the world's tiniest infectious disease model. All you can do is interact, susceptibles and interact, in, pardon me, susceptibles and infected, infected can interact and get sick. Um, and basically there's just this one term in the differential equation. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to take this model and then we're going to say that what we can measure is some fraction of the infected population. So we're, we don't, not everybody reports their illness. And so we don't observe everybody, but we get some fraction. Okay, and so to, to reduce this model, what we're going to do is we're going to notice that we could rewrite that y, that y equal to ki as i is equal to y over k and then sub in for i and get it in terms of y. Oh, I should have said, y is the, is, I'm always going to use y to indicate the thing that we can measure. So that's just as a piece of notation. Okay, so, so let's do that. And so now we get this. And now if you see here, you can solve for S 
and sub that in up there. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Come on. And so now we have an equation that's only in terms of our observed variable, right? And this, but this is an equivalent system to our original model. Um, and so we, we can see now that actually you can't estimate beta and k together, right? Because they actually blob together into an identifiable combination. And so if you tweak beta, you can undo it by tweaking k, right? And so um, this is a really simple example, but in general, these equations like this, where you've reduced your model so that it's only in, in terms of the measured variables, are called input-output equations. And you can prove that the coefficients of these things the parameter coefficients are identifiable and they contain all the structural identifiability information for your model. So basically the idea is if you have this map from parameter space to output space, you can, and you want to know about whether that map is injective, you can answer that question by looking at the map from parameter space to coefficient space. And so that's basically the idea. Um, okay, these equations get more gross when you have bigger models. So here's a slightly fancier model and it gets a little bit grosser. Um, they get, oh, okay. I was gonna, I guess, do the details of exactly what this does. You can get almost all of the parameters, but not all of them, anyway. Um, if you do a little bit fancier, this doesn't look that much worse than the last one. The equations are also pretty friendly. Um, <laughs> it gets real bad. Um, so, so yeah, so, 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 and this isn't even the end. It goes, you know, like through the wall and stuff. So it's hundreds of terms long. Now you can't do it by hand anymore, obviously. Like you have to, you have to use computational algebra methods. Um, and so for that, what we use is, so we take this sort of differential algebra approach. There's a lot of tools that you can use. You can use Grover bases if you've played with those before. Um, there's a thing called characteristic sets or differential Grover bases that do sort of the, the differential analog of what a Grover basis does. And so you can use these methods they can be slow, but recent advances have made them quite faster and computers are always, you know, ramping up. So it's become tractable to really do this with bigger models now. Um, and so that's basically the idea. I'm not going to dig into all of this. Oh, and just to give you the answer for that model that had the barf of equations a minute ago, it is actually globally structurally identifiable. So. Hooray. Um, okay, so that's that. And we're going to use this model as the basis for a bunch of the other models that we're going to talk about, so this will come back. All right, so one more method, and then I'm going to, like, uh, go from there. This will be quick. So profile likelihoods are things that probably a lot of you have used for doing confidence bounds in, in your work already. Um, the basic idea, so structural identifiability is definitely important, but it doesn't capture everything. So if you're thinking of your, like, negative log likelihood or your cost function surface, you know, you could have a minimum um, that then flattens out into something that is not visually distinguishable from the, you know, or, or practically distinguishable from the actual technical minimum value, right? And so you, the structural identifiability will tell you that you're in great shape and everything is A-OK -okay because you do actually have a unique <laughs> estimate that you can pull back to. But that doesn't tell you exactly, you know, that doesn't give you the info about the fact that some other estimates nearby might be so close that they're not really, at least statistically, distinguishable from your original, your true answer. Um, and so for that, it's really useful to look at profile likelihoods. Um, and the idea here is that you want to ex examine your likelihood surface, but your likelihood is a function of like a bajillion different parameters, right? So it's very high dimensional. Um, and so what you do is you take your, um, your each parameter one at a time and you fix that parameter to a series of values and at each of these fixed values you fit all the other parameters to get the best possible fit. I just turned my arm into an axis, so I just noticed, but anyway, whatever. Um, you, to get the best possible fit given that you stuck this parameter here and then you do it again and again and again. And then what emerges from that is that if you get something that's nice and bowl shaped, you know that you actually do have a unique minimum. Um, and if you don't, then you're set. So, um, so if you have something that's practically identifiable, you should get something like this. And you can define a threshold, so that dashed line up there, um, you, can say, you can make a threshold that lets you assign a confidence bound, so like a 90%, 95%, whatever, confidence interval for this parameter which is wherever in the, um, along the axis, wherever it crosses the threshold. Um, and so you can do this, if it's identifiable, it should look something like this. If it's structurally unidentifiable, you would expect something like this. 
um, because essentially no matter where you fix this parameter, other parameters can you know, counterbalance and get you back to that exact same goodness of fit. Um, and then if it's practically unidentifiable, maybe you get something like this, where there is a minimum, but it's not quite good enough to get you up across the threshold on either one or both sides, right? Um, and so you can also use this approach to dig into what the identifiable combinations are. If you have something like this, while you're moving this parameter from one point to the next, whatever parameter it's in combination with has to, has to compensate, right? So if you track what that other parameter does as you do this, you can see what those identifiable combinations are. So it's a convenient te technique and it's, it's used, for, used a lot in, in practice. Um, and so if we look at this model that we just um, did the differential algebra for and we found that it was globally structurally identifiable. So here's the model fit to, this is a cholera epidemic in Angola um, and, and here's what you get for your profile which looks unfortunate. Um, so, and it also looks oddly flat for something that I just told you was structurally identifiable. So what's going on? If you zoom in, there is a teeny, teeny, tiny minimum. It's in there. It's just really little. And so, um, so if you zoom in, you can find it. It's just very structurally, un or pardon me, very practically unidentifiable. Um, and the reason for that is basically it turns out that there's a, there's a, a trade-off between the decay rate of the pathogen in the water and the transmission parameter for environmental transmission. So this is a model for environmental disease transmission. So it can be transmitted by a person sheds pathogen into the water and somebody else gets it from the water when they drink from that water source. That transmission rate and the decay rate in the water trade off from one another. And so it ends up being unidentifiable. OK. You can fix that just so that you are not like sad for the rest of the day. You can fix that by taking environmental measurements. If you, if you measure pathogens in the environment or you measure, you know, uh, like in other environmental measures, you can, you can solve this issue. Okay. So that's all the methodological stuff. Um, I'm going to next talk a little bit about a couple of examples. So the first one is a cholera vaccine campaign in Mela refugee camp. So Mela, um, these are just some photos uh, that we took from uh, Mela. Oh, oh, well, actually, we didn't take this one, but these other ones. Um, and so uh, Mela is a refugee camp. Um, oh, I was going to do a cholera intro, but I'll talk about Mela first. Uh, Mela is a refugee camp on the border of Thailand and Myanmar. It was established in the 80s, so it's a very long-standing refugee camp. It's, it's a big refugee camp or something like I forget the exact number, but something like 50,000 refugees, mostly Karen, although now Rohingya and a number of other folks as well. Um, and it's been around for quite a long time. Uh, and so, so they have had for a long time cholera epidemics every couple of years, and they wanted to run a vaccination campaign. And so we were helping uh, the US CDC, Thai Ministry of Health, and an NGO called PUAMI um, with the planning and the implementation and evaluation of this vaccine campaign. Um, and so, uh, just a little quick intro to cholera, just so that everybody knows what's, what it is. So, um, it's a waterborne disease caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholera. Um, it causes <coughs> profuse watery diarrhea, vomiting, all of which can lead to dehydration that can be up to 50% fatal if left untreated, but is very rarely fatal if treated. And the treatment is easy. It's actually, you just keep the person hydrated until the infection can pass. And so, um, so that's basically the idea. Um, it's, uh, it's the sort of interesting thing about cholera is that um, it has multiple transmission pathways. So uh, you, can, you can transmit it through the environment. Um, you can also, so through environmental water sources, it can live in the, in the water, it can do that. Um, but you can also transmit it directly. You can transmit it through food. You can transmit it through household water sources. There's all these different pathways. And so we're going to collapse those pathways into sort of two blobs, um, two transmission routes that we're going to call direct, which is really going to be everything like, you know, household food preparation, actual direct transmission, household water sources, and indirect, which is going to be all of the environmental transmission pathways that use water sources outside, you know, ex external water sources. Okay. Um, and so, oh right, so this is, is Mei La, some photos of Mei La. Um, right, so this is just uh, talking about, you know, the, the, the issues in terms of cholera outbreaks. There's a river that runs through Mei La as well as a number of different water sources and so it ends up that there are cholera outbreaks every couple of years. 
Um, and so we were working on trying to help with the vaccine campaign planning. Okay, so the model we're going to use is, is a variation of this model that we looked at earlier, um, except that we have more stuff. Um, so basically, the, the vaccine requires two doses, and so you, know, so you need to track how many people get one dose versus two doses, and we need to track adults and children. So that's sort of the, it's the same model, but sort of repeated for tracking all of these different things. Um, and, so, and so that's the basic idea. Um, if you, so obviously, given that the baby model was not identifiable, of course this is going to be a disaster, right? Like, you know, of course it's not. Um, so, um, so that's true and that's a thing. Um, and so, oh, I should say also, we also included, there's, they have a lot of demographic data for the camp, so population sizes, migrations in and out, births and deaths, things like this. And so we included a number of these different features that were important um, for tracking what was happening in the camp. Um, of course, there are identifiability issues. We ended up having to make a lot of simplifying assumptions, and it still had some practical identifiability issues even after that. Um, but we were able to get it so that we could do some reasonable uh, parameter estimation. Um, the fits to the data, I'm just going to show briefly. There's a lot of uncertainty on these, but yeah. Um, I just want to show the predictions of the cholera vaccine campaign. Um, so given the coverage that they were planning to use. Um, so without the oral cholera vaccine campaign, so this is simulating they're going to run the campaign, then the following uh, summer, where, which is usually the high season for, for cholera, we're going to simulate an introduction of cholera and sort of see what happens, right? And, and we're doing this a bunch of times, of course, in part because of our parameter uncertainty, which is certainly a thing, and in part we also looked at stochasticity as well. But anyway, you can see here the, the, that if you don't run the cholera vaccine campaign, you have a pretty decent sized like, you know, probability of having a sizable outbreak. With the coverage that they had planned, it really squashes it, right? So um, you can see like pay, the, the y-axes are not the same, right? So this is really saying that, yes, this campaign has a pretty good chance of quashing a possible epidemic. Um, and so we also tried several different alternative dosing strategies. So there was a lot of concern because it wasn't very easy to track. So let's say I'm in, you're in the front, so I'm using this. Well, suppose I give you a dose now, I need to give you your second dose, but I can't I don't have any way of tracking you. So I can't necessarily go back and find you and say, hey, here's your second dose. So what if instead we did two first come, first serve rounds of vaccination, where not everybody's going to get two doses. Some people are going to get one dose the one time or one dose the other time, but not both. Is that okay? We found that basically all of those sort of variations in strategy were fine. That actually would be no problem. The main issue is that you have to do it before the cholera season starts. You cannot be late because that will really mess you up. And so, um, so anyway, so they ran the vaccine campaign. There was not an epidemic that summer, which could mean that there was not an introduction, but could also mean that you know the the, the vaccine campaign was successful. So that was really good. Um, and the we also then worked with them to forecast for the following season to see whether or not a booster campaign was needed. Um, or whether there would still be enough immunity in the population. And we were able to say that, you know, it looked like um, there would still be enough immunity in the population that you would not need to run a booster campaign. And so, uh, I mean, not just because of us, but for a lot of reasons, they did not run a booster campaign and there was no cholera epidemic the subsequent season either. Um, okay, so that's that one. I'm going to do this I, really, really fast. I, I'm, uh, I know I'm approaching the time, but I'll be fast. Anyway, so, um, so, so the last example that I wanted to talk about is um, polio and environmental surveillance. Um, and so this is just kind of an interesting one because um, we usually, in epidemiology, when we're doing infectious disease models, we are almost always working with our data is typically a time series of incidents. So, you know, numbers of cases, you know, what have you. Um, but this one was interesting because the, the, the polio epidemic that we were modeling had uh, few or no cases 
of, of incident polio, but was detected and monitored entirely through sewage, basically. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting um, question of essentially what can we do with this sewage data. Um, and there's increasing sort of recognition of the importance of environmental surveillance. And so, you know, there's a lot of questions as to sort of can we use that in a, in a useful way. Um, I'm actually going to skip the intro to polio. Um, but I will say that one thing with polio, so polio eradication has been an ongoing effort for a long time. It's, you know, gone longer than expected and way over budget, but it's almost, you know, we're getting very close. It's down to three endemic countries. Um, and, and one thing that's going to be tricky as we approach eradication for polio is that paralytic cases of polio are a teeny tip of the iceberg compared to the number of infections because it's very rare for paralysis to actually happen. Um, so most polio infections don't cause paralysis. Um, and as we get close to eradication, that iceberg is shrinking. And because of vaccination, the tip of that iceberg, that's paralysis, is actually shrinking even more. So the, the standard method for measuring and watching for polio has for a long time been looking for paralytic cases. And as we get close to eradication, that's not going to really be feasible anymore, right? Because that you know, it's going to get really small. So, um, so this really brings up the importance of potentially doing environmental surveillance. Um, and so, so that's what we were looking at. So in 2013 and 2014, there was a series of outbreaks and virus detections across multiple areas of the Middle East um, from a circulating strain in Pakistan. Um, and it, they actually caused a number of paralytic cases in Syria, although not enough cases, which is good, you know, that we could do, that you could sort of use that to really track things. Um, and there were vaccine campaigns launched in many of these different countries. Um, one of the interesting places where this was, or one of the things, places where this was found was in Israel, they have a sewage surveillance system, and they were able to track um, polio in the sewage across the country um, mostly centered in the south um, through this thing. And so it was a very interesting way of doing this because um, essentially they're testing sewage for polio at trunk lines and treatment plants and, and, and looking for both the vaccine strain of polio and the wild strain. And so what you get out of this though is this sort of aggregate measurement that can't distinguish numbers of individuals, right? Because if you find a bunch of polio in a sewage sample, you don't know whether that came from a lot of people shedding polio or a small number, one, you know, a small number of people shedding a lot of polio, right? And so, um, so it's hard to know exactly what's happening. And so the question that we wanted to answer is, can we recover information about the infected population from this? Because that's important for intervention planning and for trying to understand the epidemiology of this thing. And so, okay. So we're going to use a model that's sort of similar to the ones we've been looking at, um, where now this W compartment is not the environment in general, but it's the sewage, and we're going to measure from there. Um, okay, and then we're going to sort of expand it again to track wild virus versus vaccine virus and a number of other things. Um, the, an interesting thing about this is that because the measurement is PCR, so modeling the measurement is kind of an interesting piece. So you, every time you run a cycle of this, it doubles the copy number of what's in your sample. And then you, the measurement that you actually get, the data you get, is the number of cycles that it took for the copy number to cross this threshold. And so it's kind of a funny, like a little bit of a funny measurement model, and it meant for some funky things about the likelihood for our implementation of this. Um, but you can work this out to figure out you know, if your number of cycles needed is this, then, you know, if you, let's say epsilon here is one, so you're approximately doubling every time, you can back this out to say, okay, so what we're measuring is, uh, you know, this sort of log thing off of the actual concentration in the, or, you know, copy number in the original sewage sample. Um, and so you can, you can do this kind of thing. Um, okay, of course, identifiability issues cropped up again, and in particular, there's some, uh, structural identifiability issues between the shedding and measurement parameters and also some practical identifiability issues for the decay rate of the pathogen in the environment where you get this sort of like there is actually if you zoom in a little teensy tiny minimum in here but it's pretty darn flat right this is pretty bad um, you can actually end up reparameterizing your model and reduce the dimension so that you can work some of this out when you do that what ends up happening is that what you can get is population proportions 
transmission rates, and some of some of the other um, parameters, you cannot get actual population sizes. So you can essentially, from this data and this model, you can estimate the fraction of the population that was shedding or infectious at a given time. You can't estimate the number, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, but so that's sort of that thing. Um, here's the model fit to the data. Um, and, and they were measuring the vaccine virus in the sewage as well. So that's there too. Um, the profile likelihoods. And so just to, as sort of the last thing I just want to show, so here's the, the we, can, we can recover the fraction of the population that was infectious at any given time. There's a lot of, this bar doesn't show up very well, but there's a lot of uncertainty in this, but you can get some information about that, um, which ends up showing that a, really it's, I think, over 50, at, once you sort of integrate the cumulative incidence of this, over 50% of the population at risk w looks like it may have been shedding polio virus at one time or another. Now, population at risk is a key word here because that doesn't mean the entire population, right? So that's, that's one thing. But anyway, um, all right. So this was sort of a, a proof of concept um, that for doing uh, modeling work with environmental surveillance data. Um, and I think we can do a lot more with this, um, which we're working on now. Um, and so with that, to kind of get us close-ish to back on time, I'd like to thank my students and collaborators and the folks who've provided us with data and collaborated with us and the folks who've provided us with funding. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. So you mentioned that one of the things that you did for the cholera outbreak is that you ran two separate vaccination campaigns. Did you, um, was it when you ran the model on that, did you just assume that randomly people might only get one or did you assume, because uh, there's something of an effect where people say, okay, oh, I, I only need the one, therefore I am, I am finished. That's an excellent question. So we did not do that, although we, because, <laughs> certainly will and probably did, you know, misunderstand and say, oh, no, I got my vaccine, I'm done. Um, we did run as, like, an extreme case scenarios where people only got one. So okay. that, that way, you know, then it's like everybody does that. And so, you know, so at least that way, yeah, you can get some sense of it. So, yeah. And it still was, it's, in those runs, it, I mean, it was, you know, it wasn't as good as when people do the, get both doses, but it still was the case that the vaccine campaign looked like it would squash things. So. Okay. Will work. So uh, the question I had is: so you have these uh, parameter identifiability, identifiability methods. Terrible word. Yeah, but that's fine. Um, so how do you account for the fact that the models themselves may have structural oh, issues? I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Keep going. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Keep going. Well, that's the beginning of the question. You can finish it and okay. answer it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I, I almost put that in this talk and then I decided it was too many things already. But I mean, yeah, so I do a lot of work on parameter identifiability that neglects the fact that model misspecification is way bigger as our, like, and we do that all the time. I mean, like the George Box quote, all models are wrong, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, um, so yeah, I mean, that is certainly a much bigger thing that we, so we do some work with that. Um, some of it where we look at families of models and we look at, you know, what happens if you um, t test these different models against one another. Um, it is definitely a bigger thing. It's also harder, right? Because when it comes to, uh, to identifiability, we have this really convenient space to work in, right? Parameters live in RN or whatever, you know, thing that we want them to live in. Um, Models live in a much more complicated and pain in the butt space, right? So, like, pardon me, but you know, yeah. So, so, so that makes it very tricky, um, and and so there are a lot of exciting new methods, though, and so like a lot of things with small regression and things like this that I think can be used to look at some of these issues. But it's it's tougher because you know you can't. Um, you know, it, when you're doing identifiability, you often have constraints or priors or what have you about where your parameter ought to live. Um, and you can use that, and it's easier to implement those kinds of things. When you're looking at model structure uncertainty, 
you have a lot of information about like, oh, well, this mechanism could work, but only with this thing, and like, you know, it's a little bit more complicated, and it's sort of more of a like tree of possible models. Um, and so that, I think, makes it a little bit more challenging, but really important. So yeah, anyway, that's my little soapbox, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. One question. Okay. Direct, okay. Director's prerogative. Uh -huh. uh, so, so, so actually, get, uh, leading off Karthik's question, I mean, you, th there's a further difficulty that you, you have very sparse data re right. relative to the rest of physics oh, or, yeah. or even material science where we do system identification, while material systems tend to be the same year upon year. Yeah. But cholera outbreaks are not necessarily the same. The organism mutates. Right. And, and now, so, so, okay, all kinds of issues, right? So do you do sparse data methods? And furthermore, with system identifiability, is it when, when mutations happen, is it that the parameter changes or do, 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 do things mutate so badly that the structure? That That's, so it depends. So for cholera, not so much. I mean, um, for other, other viruses or other, other pathogens, it certainly can be the case. Um, you know, you could have something that, you know, I don't know, just making something off the top of my head, like um, take. Zika as an example, you know, or a lot of these mosquito-borne, a lot of viruses, for instance, you know, may have some sort of dominant transmission pathway like the mosquito, but another one like sexual transmission that is not so common, but with enough mutations, you might have a virus emerge where that is more common and now you could previously have ignored that pathway and now you have to include it, right? So, um, so I do think there is a lot, I mean, so it, it ends up meaning that the space of what you can answer gets restricted to some degree. I mean, I'm also not showing all of the data that we're using in some of these. So we often use, so for cholera, for instance, a lot of the time we're using satellite precipitation data. So we have a lot more data than what I'm necessarily showing, but it is definitely the case that you're working, these time series are like, you know, in this symposium, those time series are like, hello, oh, you're so little. You know, like, yeah, so it's, it's definitely the case that you're working with a pretty small data set, and, and so then it limits the kinds of things that you can answer in a lot of cases. Yeah, yeah. And you do have to be extra careful about this issue of, of model misspecification. Yeah, when that happens. Yeah. Well, if no further questions, thanks, thanks again, Marisa, and thank you all. <laughs> we are